All right, Sue. Thanks for the false advertisement, Sue. And by the way, Sue, shave your head. You're going bald. Yeah. I yeah. And it's okay. It's okay. It. Going bald. I just had a baby daughter, so I mean. Oh, God bless her, man. Well, how old are you? I'm 27. You're a young man, but still, fight it. Shave your head. Make bald look beautiful. <laughs> I God bless you, young child, and preserve you and guide us into the fullness of the truth. So you contacted me. What's going on, buddy? So uh, I've actually been talking to a Christian friend. Uh, we've been kind friends of that are Christian. <laughs> and, uh, we came to an agreement that uh, we need to put our difference, our differences, to the side. All right. Not uh, invoke hatred and anger, because we both do believe in one God, and we both do know that the devil is the clear enemy and yes, he is. He tries his best to cause chaos between our own people and, you know, just people in general. hundred percent. TC is sent to deceive, confuse and confound, but God almighty is greater than Satan. So we need to be open to the voice of God and ask God to get us to the truth. That's what you pray too, right? You pray that you'll be guided to the straight path and kept on the straight path. So if God is real and you and I both believe he is, may he answer that prayer. So, I mean, so talk to me, friend. I don't know. Go ahead. Talk to me. Now I, I, I've seen you on my Skype, but I get so many people who Skype me. I forget. So forgive me that I don't remember. I get no, too many people every day typing me and I get confused and lost, but go ahead. You're good. I know you speak to a lot of people. I've been. Yeah, it gets like, tired. I you. get tired, buddy, but I'm human. Uh, yeah, of course we all are. We all make error, trial and error. It's part of life. Even though you're a handsome young man, and you're human still, but you gotta <laughs> shave the head, dude. Shave that. But go I, ahead, talk. I tried the, the the clean look, and I just I don't know. I cut it. I like the beard, just the hair. Shave it, man. So you're fighting a losing battle. But go ahead, my friend. I'll try to do my best, man. I right. I don't know everything, but I'll trust the spirit. Go ahead. So my first question is, uh, I feel a lot of Christians feel that they're entitled to heaven so my question is do all christians go to heaven i don't know you're using the term christian very loosely now i'm sorry i am listening to you i'm having a live stream with you this guy saying can we ask questions you see why i lose my temper and my patience not just with muslims with everyone i'm an equal opportunist hater i insult everybody even christians now that's not good though <laughs> well Sometimes you need to put people in their place. Sometimes you need to be gentle. There's a time and place. May the Holy Spirit guide me to know when to be mean and when to be nice. Now, to answer your question, uh, no Christian who knows his faith thinks he's entitled to heaven. That's actually the opposite message. A Christian who understands his faith, because you have a lot of Christians who pay lip service. They don't know the Bible. They don't know their faith, just like you have a lot of Muslims who know. That's just common. You can be born in a home that is Muslim and not know Islam. You can be born in a home that's Christian and not know Christianity. But to answer your question, no Christian knows the Bible, thinks he's entitled or she's entitled to heaven, because if we were to try to earn heaven, God's standard would be perfection, to be perfectly faultless, and we fail and deserve hell. So we plead the mercy of Jesus Christ and the grace of Jesus Christ and cling to him and trust in him what he did to save us. So we got to correct that. Secondly, not every Christian is truly a Christian. Jesus said that. Matthew 7, I'm going to give you references. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, he is very clear. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. For many shall come to me on that day, meaning the day of judgment, what you would call Yom al -Qiyama, Yom al -Din, the day of judgment, yeah. right? Many will come to me on day, that day and say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not preach in your name? Prophet, I mean, did we preach about you? Cast out demons in your name. We use your name to cast out demons, right? And perform many signs and wonders in your name. Didn't we do miracles using your name? And Jesus says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawless ones. Lawless ones means you claim to be a Christian, but you didn't obey me. So the Lord says, someone who's a true follower will try to obey him. Now, we're not going to do it perfectly. That's where toba, repentance, comes in. So when you say all Christians go to heaven, Jesus said many will claim to be Christian and will not enter. That's what Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. So, so I mean, 
if that's the case, then Jesus dying for our sins isn't the only reason that takes us to heaven. No, actually, that's very, again, confusion. Jesus' death is what makes your toba, your repentance, and your good deeds acceptable to God. In other words, if Christ did not come and die to pay your debt, no matter how much you pray, no matter how good, how much good you do, God will never be pleased with you because Jesus said, abide in me and I in you and you shall bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So no one is saying that it's simply obeying Christ that brings you into heaven. No, it is Jesus, what he did for us, but to show that what he did for us hasn't been something we've taken advantage of or in vain. The Lord says, I died for you, for you to live for me, to be my slave. So he died to set me free from the power of Satan, his influence, from the power of sin, so I can be his property. That's why we call him Lord. He owns me. So if Jesus died, and yet I claim to be a Christian, but ignore him, then that means I haven't truly Except received his gift, because to receive his gift is to submit to him, what you call submission. So we're both on the same page. We need to submit. The question is, who do you submit to? You're saying submit to Allah of the Quran. We're saying we submit to God's son, Jesus Christ. Well, Allah in, in Arabic just means God. So Yeah, but who is Allah in Arabic? Because the term in Arabic is used by Christians to call Father Allah, Jesus yeah. Allah, Holy Spirit is Allah. So is Jesus your Allah? Allah just means God. I, I believe is Jesus your Allah? No, I just believe so then that. it doesn't just mean God. It's how you use it. Because in John 1, 1, if you read but, your Arabic Bible. Because there are people that think their God is, is a cow, you know. So yes, I understand that. Your God is not my God, though. That's just a fact. Your yeah, God is mine. Yeah, that's true. But at the same time, there's only one God. Yeah, but it's not your God. That's my point. If a Greek comes and tells me when Zeus is the one God, Zeus is the one God. Does that mean you're worshiping Zeus because you say there's one God? I don't believe in Zeus. Okay, so I don't believe in all of the Quran because what I'm trying to tell you, the word Allah, the way I use it, the Father is Allah, Jesus is Allah, the Holy Spirit is Allah. So if you read my Arabic Bible, because you're saying Arabic, John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with Allah. The Word was Allah. So the Word became flesh. That Word, Kalimat Allah, he's called Allah. But So I want to know, do you call Jesus Allah? No. Hebrews 1.8 in the Arabic Bible. If you open up Hebrews 1.8, the Arabic Bible, the father says to the son, he says, and about the son, he, up, the father says, your throne, Ya Allah, is forever and ever. So in Arabic, in my Arabic Bible, Jesus is called Ya Allah. So can you say, Isa, Huwa Allah, Jesus is Allah. No. That's why your Allah, my Allah are not the same. So either I have the true Allah. Um, Hebrews. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Hebrews. No, no, it's okay. But I'm trying to let you know. Either I have the true Allah or I have the false Allah, but we don't have the same Allah. Right. That's that's it. So now we got to decide who has the true Allah. Right. So go ahead. Honestly, it, if if we knew there wouldn't be, you know, two billion Muslims or two billion Christians, they'd all be one, you know. But um, going back on the Hebrews, is that from the Old Testament? The book of Hebrews, or are you talking about the Old Testament written in Hebrew? That, that verse that you said. No, Hebrew is written by one of the Hawadiyun disciples of Jesus, his followers. So that's in the in the, the Old New Testament. Testament, yes. The New Testament? Yeah, because New Testament is the revelation of Jesus. Old Testament is the revelation of the prophets before Jesus, what you call <laughs> the Torah or Zabur, that's before Jesus. New Testament is the revelation about Jesus after he came and what he taught. And what his disciples taught in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Torah is the Old Testament? The term Torah in Arabic or Torah in Hebrew can refer to the five books of Moses or to the Old Testament. So Maybe the, all the books. The Jewish faith, they read the Old Testament? Yeah, well, it depends on what Jews you mean. Like a Orthodox Jew. Well, the Orthodox Jews, yeah. But they don't, only, they don't only go with the Old Testament. They go with the Talmud. The, the Talmud. Talmud. The rabbinic interpretation so it's not just old testament they don't just go with the they go with how the rabbis explain the old testament like you have the sunnah if you're a sunni yeah 
So you don't just go with the Quran. You go with the Sunnah. The Hadith. You also go with the scholars, the ulama, the ijma, like they say. The, in rabbinic Judaism, they don't just have the Old Testament. They have the Talmud, the rabbinic explanation. Okay. That makes sense. Right. Okay. Uh, yes, it's your time, buddy. I'm here to try to answer. No, I appreciate the feedback. Uh, my second question is, is hell for Christians permanent? Hell, you mean this hell everlasting destruction? Yeah, like the... Yeah, you know, you're asking a very good question. Yeah, uh, if you go historically and you see how Christians have understood the New Testament, because I have to explain... My answer is I can't just say yes or no. I have to explain because sadly, in all of these major religions, you have groups and subgroups, right? So Islam, you have Sunnis, and Sunnis you have Ashari and Maturidi and Salafi, and among the Salafi you have how many different branches? The Shia, and then you have Quran only Muslims. Even in Christianity, you're going to have Orthodox, and you're going to have Oriental Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox, and you're going to have Catholic, Eastern Catholic, Byzantine Catholic, Roman Catholic. Then you have Protestants. And in the Protestants, you have Lutherans. So you we're all messed up. Please so, tell me the differences sorry. between Orthodox and Catholic. Orthodox Catholic, well, the main differences between Orthodox and Catholic up until 1054 AD, they were one, but they split. And they split over the Pope if he's the head of all Christians on earth and whether the spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. These are two of the main issues. But if you look at it, they all believe the Trinity, they all believe Jesus is God in the flesh, just to tell you what they all believe. They all believe that Mary remained a virgin throughout her life. She didn't have any children. They all believe in what they call intercession of the saints, something in Islam, you may not believe because I don't know if you're Salafi. You have what's called tawassul, wasila, where there are Muslims who say you can ask the awliya, the friends of Allah, to pray for you. You can ask Muhammad to pray for you. This is called tawassul. Now, Salafi Muslims, Salafi Muslims don't accept this. They say it's, it's, uh, it can get close to shirk. Some say it is shirk. But similarly, in Christianity, Orthodox and Catholic, they have what's called intercession of the saints, meaning those who die in faith and are in heaven and they're alive, they pray for us and we, we can ask them to pray for us. So we can say, to the Blessed Mother, the Holy Virgin, Theotokos. <clears throat> Holy Mother, pray for us. St. Paul, pray for us. Oh, the, dead, pray for dead, us. the dead can pray for you. They're not dead. The Bible says they're alive. Even your Quran says they're not dead. I know their soul is alive, but I'm saying... So why are they dead? No, I mean physically in this world, they're not alive. Yes. You're assuming the physical life is the true life, whereas you and I both know based on Revelation, uh, the I'm true life is the Akhira. This is a shadow. Yeah, this is temporary. This is they mm -hmm. say it's like it's like uh, we, we call it we call ourselves travelers. You know, this is right. not, so. so even though I know what you mean, they're dead physically. We don't use the term dead because to someone who doesn't know dead means that they are no longer existing. But the Bible says those who die in Christ physically, they're still alive and they're perfected. They're enjoying a higher <clears throat> form of life. Now, that's also in your Quran. I mean, I'm just appealing to her because you believe in it. Because in Surah Al-Baqarah, if you have your Quran, you'll see in chapter yep. 2, read it first, Surah Al-Baqarah 2, 154. Uh, if I thought you had it. Okay, so I thought you were reaching. Anyway, in Surah Al-Baqarah 2, 154, it tells you the martyrs who are killed do not say they're dead. They're not dead, but they are alive with their Lord. Do not say they're dead. They're alive. Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2, verse 154. So we believe that all souls don't die, no matter yeah. what you believe in. Like nobody, That's, yeah. Like the reason why I say dead or die is yeah. because we're referring to this life. We're not referring yeah. to the after, because we know that after we we die in this world, we're gonna live on eternally, whether it's in heaven or hell. You know, in Sunni Islam, I just explain to people because they don't know much about Islam. In your sunnah, if you go with the sunnah, it says that there is life in barzakh where someone who dies, he will be in the grave alive. If he is wicked, 
he'll be tortured and tormented by dragons. But if he's righteous, he will be there in peace, awaiting the day of resurrection, where his body will come out, and then he'll dwell in Jannah forever. So in Christianity, Christianity, those who die believing in Jesus Christ, when their souls leave, they go to heavenly paradise, and they're there in perfect peace, joy, and rest. And we are taught that they're alive and they're aware of what takes place on earth. Similarly, in Islam, Sunni Islam, and the Shia believe this, if you're not Salafi, the Muslims believe the awliya, the friends of Allah who die, they too are made aware by an angel or Allah that you're asking for their wasila, their intercession. So what was my point? Orthodox and Catholic believe in what's called intercession of saints, that those who are glorified and are alive, they pray for us and we can ask them to pray. So Orthodox Catholic, they accept that. So just to let you know what they accept because you're asking me the differences. The main difference is, is the Pope the head of the church or is he one of many bishops? They're equal. And another difference, which you have to study, is does the spirit proceed from the father or the father and the son? Big debate, big issues. But where they agree, this is what I need you to agree on. Now, brethren, you see this, this uh, prostitute here. Her name is 69 Fabulosity. You understand this is a whore? You understand that she's trying to promote porn here? You see it right here, 69 Fabulosity. Mods, can you get rid of this trash, this whore? So you know what I'm talking about, brother. Look, look at this filthy trash. Look at what her name is. 69 Fabulosity. That's what you call yourself? 69 Fabulosity. Get her out of here. Shame. Sorry, brother. If, um, maybe you're too young to understand. We who are filthy in the world until God saved us, 69 is a sexual position. Yeah, that's true. You see what she's doing? And she, anyway, sorry to the distraction. The Lord rebuke all distractions. Now, coming back to the issue with you. So, the Orthodox agree, intercession of saints, they agree. Mary remained a virgin. They agree that the Trinity is God. Jesus is God in the flesh. They agree, right? Praying for the dead. They agree the Eucharist becomes the flesh and blood of Christ. So, they agree a lot more than they disagree. So, they have a lot more in common than disagreement. So really, it's just the Pope. Pope is the main issue, and the, does the Spirit come from the Father and the Son? Just two of many issues, but these are the main issues. But everything else, they agree. Like even baptizing infants and that water baptism grants you the Holy Spirit to make you alive and unite you to Christ. Okay. Yeah. So I, had, I had the impression, a lot of Christians told me that uh, Catholicism is like satanic. And yeah, yeah. Those me. Christians who told you, if you ask them, they're Protestants. You ask them, your movement, when did it start? It started in the 16th century, 1500s after Christ. And that would be seven hundred, close to 800 years after the time of Muhammad. So how are you calling the Catholic Church satanic when the Catholic Church was there before you? Who? Them, those Christians that are telling you the Catholic oh. Church. Satanic. I mean, I don't know. I've seen some videos of like the Pope kissing the Rothschild's hands and Oh yeah, well you have the Pope kissing the Quran. I condemn that. So you're okay with the Pope kissing the Quran? What's wrong with that? See, exactly. See, to you it's okay kiss the kiss the Quran. And one thing about in Catholic teaching, the Pope is not sinless. The Pope isn't faultless. The Pope can make mistakes when he does yeah private judgment, or personal daily activity. The only time the Pope is guided, according to the Catholics, is when he pronounces, this is what the faith is, and all the faithful must believe it, and this is what morality is. They believe that's when the Spirit will protect them from error. But what he does personally, that's something he'll answer to God, because no Catholic here, there are Catholics here, they don't think the Pope is sinless, he can make mistakes and he can make right. decisions that are incorrect. That's his own personal, everyday choices. Right. He's a human right. being. Exactly. So when you say Pope kissed the Rothschild, even let's say that's true. That just tells you that this Pope is compromised and he's in sin. But as long as when he's talking about faith and morals, what you must believe and what you must do, he doesn't make a mistake there. Whatever he does in his personal life, God will deal with him. Because if you read the Bible and your Quran carefully, 
You even have true prophets of God making sins that God has to rebuke them for. And in your Quran and in your Sunnah, your prophet is rebuked for sinning. I'm not aware of his sins. It's all throughout the Quran. He's getting rebuked for sinning. Do you want me to show you those verses? Do you want to read them or you want me to read them for you? No, I'd like to hear a couple from you. Okay, so you want me to read them? Okay, I'll read them. All right, hold on. Let me get them for you. So let me get them for you. So I'll get them up. Uh, let me just get it. So here you go. Uh, let me line them up. Let's use what you we'll use. Halali uh, Khan and Tikthal, two translations. But let me line them up first, buddy. 105. 107 one second i gotta line them up so give me a second guys guys i'm gonna have to line up the verses and then i'll probably put them on the screen but Before i'll make the verse number with this so what's your short answer to is hell permanent oh yeah because you asked me about the difference between orthodox and catholic so do you want me to answer that or do you want me to go to muhammad yeah. being rebuked for sins? And go on to muhammad sins say it again i didn't hear you broke up let's finish let's finish that subject and then we can move yeah. on to Muhammad. So yeah else. so why i mention all these denominations because sadly today you can ask 10 christians and get 50 answers so today in protestantism they'll tell you that hellfire is not permanent hellfire is not permanent so if you go to hell you can come out and go back to no. heaven you'll be wiped out you disappear you'll be annihilated annihilated you'll be wiped out so though they're called conditionalists so they are protestants who say they follow only the bible but they interpret the bible to teach that those in hell will be tormented but they'll be wiped out of existence they won't be tormented forever so this is something that spread in recent christian history among protestants now if you go to the ancient churches, the churches that were there before the Protestant Reformation, you go to the Orthodox, the Catholic, Syrian Church of the East, the Orthodox Catholic, they all teach that hell will be everlasting punishment. Everlasting punishment. So if you're in hell, your punishment will be never ending. You will be punished eternally. Now, interestingly, something you need to... You left, okay, came back. Are you back? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, because you left for a minute to connection there. Okay. Interestingly, something I'm going to encourage you to do, I need you to study. Here's what you're going to study. Even in Islam, now you have Muslims, like those who only follow the Quran, that actually believe hell is not forever either. That you'll go to hell, but you'll be annihilated. And you'll even find someone like Shabir Ali. So you don't take my word for it. Go to Shabir Ali's YouTube channel. Let the Quran speak. Let the Quran speak. Put in hell. He will tell you that there were Salafi Muslims like Ibn Taymiyyah and a student, Ibn Qayyim al Josiyah, who taught that there are verses in the Quran that suggest that those in hell will not be punished forever. So we believe in eternal hell, but we also. Which Muslim believes that? I'm a Sunni. So. Yeah, but I just told you Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim al Josiyah, they're Salafi Sunnis. And Ibn Taymiyyah is considered one of the greatest scholars for the Salafi Muslims. They wrote tracts questioning whether hell is forever. So I say, don't take my word for it. Go to Shibra Ali, let the Quran speak. There you'll find Shibra Ali, who's a Sunni, saying there are those in Sunni tradition that deny that hell, its punishment is forever. Yeah, so uh, they say it can be forever for some people, but they say also that it can be temporary. It could be. You no, know, I'm not talking. I know what you're talking about. I'm not talking about the Muslims who die and they'll be taken out of hell. I no. know that in Sunni Islam. I'm talking about and, anybody. Yeah, well, they say that either they'll be annihilated and hell will be wiped out or there's a possibility they'll come out. So there is also a difference. So what I'm saying is the problem we have as Christians, because we have different groups that understand the Bible differently, is a problem that's that's – not just a Christian problem. It's a problem that Muslims have and Jews have. Because when you have different groups, you're going to have different opinions, all claiming to have the right view of the Bible or tradition. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, though, with Islam, we all believe in Muhammad as the last messenger. We, we believe in all the prophets, and we do believe that Allah is, like, the one God that nobody ever seen. But okay. You say Allah no, never have been seen according to what tradition? To... Our, it's not tradition, it's religion. 
Yeah, but what religious tradition? Because you, because like I said, in Islam, it's not just Sunni. It's Shia, Quran only. Not only that, but in Sunni, you have Salafi, you have Ashari, Maturidi. And in Salafi, you have Mah Mahdaris. And, you know. Yeah, we generally, like, we all believe in the same thing. Like, we all have the same no. thing for the most part. You don't, not all of you believe in the same thing. The Sunnis don't, because here, I'll give example. The Salafis, those who claim to be Salafi, they follow the Salaf Salih. They claim. They'll tell you that Allah has two right hands, he has a foot, he has a shin, he has a waist, he has eyes, and these are his attributes. They're not metaphorical. He actually has them, and they're unlike anything in creation. You have other Sunni Muslims that are Ashari, Maturidi, like Hamza Yusuf or Imam Zayed Shakir or Ali Atayi. They go, no, Allah's ha hands, that's a metaphor. They do ta'wil, that they say, metaphor. He doesn't have hands. It just means his power. His eyes, it means he sees. So here you have two groups of Sunnis. The Salafis, right? Like, for example, who should I? Uh, Sheikh Asim Al-Hakim. Others, okay? Who say Allah has actual eyes. He has actual hands. They're both right. He's an, he has an actual foot. He's an, he has an actual shin. And away, unlike anything creation, but he has these, and we do not explain them away. But then you have the other Sunni Muslims, Hamza Yusuf, Imam Zayed Shakir, others who are not Salafi, you say, no, no, no. The eyes of Allah means he sees, he doesn't have eyes. So they can't even agree on that. So when you tell me, you all agree, no, you don't. There's a difference. I believe that... Uh... That if you go to hell, you have a chance to go to heaven. If it's not eternal, that's what I was taught. Okay, well, I mean that, but we're talking about the, uh, all the Muslims agree. No, not even among the Sunnis. Not all. I'm not saying that's just a Islam problem. Even Christianity, in Christianity, I can line up ten Christians on a given subject, and they're going to have different. I'm not talking about the average Christian. I'm talking about even scholars, the Christian okay. scholars on certain issues. They're all going to disagree. Okay. So basically, okay, well, what, what do you think according to, you think it's eternal? Hell is eternal? Uh, as far as my view is, I try to submit to the ancient church's understanding. So instead of going with modern trend, my goal is to get back to the ancient church as much as possible. So my journey, and that's my prayer, is that the Holy Spirit will guide me to the ancient church's understanding of the Bible, and from what I see, the ancient Christians believe that hell is forever. And if that's what they taught, I'm not one to come and question them. Right. I don't care for what modern people say today. I do not care what some Christians today tell me what they think the Bible is. I want to go to the ancient churches. I want to go to the Christians who either knew the apostles, disciples of the apostles, or their disciples, their successors. So, I want to know what Polycarp, he was a disciple of the apostles, or Ignatius or Irenaeus. And as far as I can tell, unless I see evidence contrary, I see that they believe that hell's forever. Now, there are some Protestants they know they were uh, they had different opinions, but that's where I'm looking to. I want to see the Christians who are closest to the apostles, how they interpreted the Bible, how they understood the Bible, because they're the ones entrusted with the Bible to preserve the writings, to explain them and defend them. And at times they even died for those writings. So that's my understanding for now. Okay. Tell me about it, Holy Smoke. But go ahead. Any other questions? I wanted to go back on the first question that I asked, which was, uh, can Christians go to hell? And you told me. When you say Christians, I just said, Jesus said, many think they're Christians. No, but no, that's I know, I know what you mean, but like I mean, for the people that actually accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they try their best to no, uh, no, no. Those who truly love Jesus and cling to Him, they, because of the blood of Christ and His mercy, will dwell with Him forever. This is where the cross of Christ comes in, because no one can be perfect and obey God blamelessly. No, of course not. And so, when you acknowledge your sin and failure, and you ask God for mercy. The mercy you are shown is because of what Jesus did for you. It's the blood of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, that guarantees that your repentance, when you do toba, your confession will be accepted and you'll be forgiven so you can dwell with Christ forever.
So before Jesus came, uh, you repenting without it being in the name of Jesus was accepted by God. It was all because of Jesus, even in the past. That's what the Bible teaches. I'm talking about when Moses. And yes. Abraham it was all because of Jesus, even in the past. That's what the Bible teaches, that all the prophets were given revelation by God that they will be accepted and forgiven because of the Messiah to come. Jesus said that. He taught it. I can show you that. So when you say before Christ, from God's perspective, when he created the creation and Adam and Eve sinned, God had already planned that they would be forgiven and granted salvation because the Son of God would come and die for them in order to <clears throat> bring about their forgiveness and everlasting redemption. That's in the Bible. So I can show you Jesus saying it. It's not me. You want me to show you where Jesus says the prophets all look to him? I know one verse where he says that I come before Abraham. Not only that, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see me and he saw me. He didn't just say before Abraham. He just said, your father Abraham... <clears throat> rejoiced to see me and he saw me he says that in john 8 56 your father abraham rejoiced at seeing my day he saw it and was glad he so, saw me and saw my coming and was glad that's what he said john 8 56 then jesus said also in john 5 45 47 do not think he's talking to the jews who reject him do not think that i will accuse you before the father that on the day of judgment i will condemn you before my father for what is your accuser, Moses, upon whom you've set your hopes, because you follow his writings. For if you believe Moses, you'd believe me. He wrote about me. Moses wrote about me, spoke about me, pointed to me, believed in me. But how can you believe in me when you don't believe in Moses? John 5, 45, 47. Not only that, Jesus says that David worshipped him as Lord. Mark 12. 35, 37. I'm giving you the Bible. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Jesus asks the religious scholars, the Christ, Messiah, whose son is he? Because you, you call him Messiah. They go, the son of David, because he's going to come from the house of David. He goes, how then, David, speaking by the Holy Spirit. David, speaking, the Holy Spirit revealing to David, making known to David to speak and write calls Messiah Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, Rab said to Rabbi, my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. How then can Messiah be the son of David when David calls Messiah Lord? So Jesus said, David called the Messiah his Lord. Jesus said that David called him Lord. Yes, Mark 12, 35, 37. That means the Spirit revealed to David the Messiah to come is more than his son. He's also his Lord. That's Mark 12, 35, 37. I can show it to you on the screen if you want. No, no, you're fine. Uh, I mean, this is this is live, so I know you're not going to just lie. No, and I gave you the references to go back and watch. So you understand, according to our Bible, all the prophets were waiting for the Messiah, Jesus, and trusted in Jesus because God revealed to them he's coming and he came. This is why we reject anyone who comes and tries to say, no, he's the prophet and the seal of the prophets and a messenger after him because Jesus said, they all pointed to me, they all looked to me, they all hoped in me, and they all loved me because it was revealed to them, I am coming to save them. Psalm 110, yes. Someone asking me. So, I mean, Jesus is still coming on Judgment Day to, yes. to save us. So what, what if that was it? Say it again. Sorry. What if that uh like him referring referring to his present self rather than like his future self? To all of it, that they were told of his coming to save them by the cross, and then him reigning in heaven as Lord, because that's what David said. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, and him then coming to judge the living and the dead. It's all they were revealed. Some prophets were given more revelation than others, but it's in the Old Testament. In fact, why do you think the Jews, the Jews who don't believe in Jesus, why do you think they're waiting for Messiah? Where do you think they got that idea from? It's from their Torah. Exactly. So you understand? Even the Jews who don't believe in Jesus see in their Torah, the Old Testament, that the prophets announce Messiah would come. 
They don't believe Jesus is Messiah. They believe Messiah so, hasn't come. Here's the thing about Islam. We learn, we're taught that the Jews' Messiah is the Antichrist. Oh, they teach you that? I didn't know that. Yeah. Islam that, says that the, the, the one that the Jews that, are awaiting is Antichrist? That's okay. why until today, the Jews are still waiting for their Messiah. Because it's ironic. So you guys, you hear that, right? The Muslims are taught that the Messiah that the Jews are waiting for will be Al-Masih, Al-Dajjal, the Antichrist. And yet there are Christians who say the Mahdi that you're waiting for, he's the Antichrist. No, no. The Mahdi is actually, we're taught that the Mahdi is fought, fights next to Jesus. Yeah, but the Christians are taught your Mahdi that you're waiting for is the Antichrist. No, no, no. So... That's what the Christians believe. I'm not I saying. Believe, that's what they believe. believe that Jesus is the is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. Yeah, but you don't know what it means for him to be Messiah. What does it mean for him to be Messiah? The anointed one. But what does that mean to be anointed? Anointed to do the what? Anointed one from God. Anointed He's from God to do what? When you're anointed, you're anointed save, to do something. To save everybody on Judgment Day. Oh, so you think Jesus is going to save people on the Day of Judgment? He is. Okay, so when he comes and he saves... So when you mean save, he's going to make everyone Muslim? He's going to fight the people that don't believe in him. And so he's going to make everyone Muslim or they die, right? I mean, the, the, jail is going, the Antichrist is going to be killing Muslims. He's going to be killing believers. He's going to be I know. They actually uh, because I understand what you believe about end time. I want the Christian to understand what you are taught. I know what you believe. Al-Masih al-Dajjal will come. He'll do miracles. He's one eye. And on his head, it's written the word kufr. Yeah, right, right. He's gonna do miracles and he's gonna deceive people to worship him as God, as an Ilah. Right. And those who don't worship him, he'll kill. And then Messiah Jesus comes down with two angels on a white minaret in Syria, and then by his appearance, he's gonna kill El Masih al Dajjal and his army, and then he's gonna rule on earth and as and judge the world for 40 years, but that's when he's gonna make everyone Muslim, right. Uh, I don't think that's in the hadith. It says he will come, he will abolish the jizya. The jizya in chapter 9, verse 29, Surah Al Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 29. The jizya is what Jews and Christians pay to live in Muslim rule. The, the hadith in Bukhari Muslim says Jesus is going to abolish the jizya and he's going to destroy every cross he sees and kill every pig. Why? Because no other religion will be allowed except Islam. That means all Christians and Jews, everyone must become Muslim because there'll be no more non-Islamic religions. That's why there'll be no more jizya. I if mean, only... here's, the thing. here's the thing. I don't think you need to be Muslim really to follow Jesus on that day. Well, then where, why does he abolish the jizya? The Quran says, I'm telling you what the Quran says, chapter 9, verse 29. If you're a Jew or a Christian, and you want to live as a Jew and Christian under Islamic rule, you pay jizya. Right. But he's going to abolish the jizya. How is he going to aggregate the Quran? That means he's canceling out the Quran. I mean, he's a prophet, but... I so then to abolish the jizya means I there'll be no more non-Muslims. So we believe before Judgment Day, actually, the Quran will be, will be gone. It will be vanished. But then the Bukhari says that Isa will judge according to the Sharia of the Quran, not the gospel. So how's it going to vanish? Because he's going to know the word of God. He, I mean, but he's I, still going to implement the Sharia of the Quran. Says so the law of the Quran, not the law of the gospel. I don't, I don't think the prophets really need a book to know what God. God no, it's okay. I don't care what the book. But it, your prophet said in Bukhari, I can get that deed for you. When Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus son of Mary, descends. He's going to follow the law of the Quran, not the gospel. He's going to still implement Sharia according to the Quran, the law of the Quran. Right. But that's my point. If he's still following the law of the Quran, well, the Quran says that you have to take jizya, this money from Jews and Christians who want to live as Jews and Christians. But he's going to wipe out the jizya. The only way you can wipe out the jizya is there'll be no more Judaism and Christianity. Everyone has to become Muslim. Okay. I mean, I do believe that uh, Jesus was Muslim. Yeah, but why do you believe that? Because he submitted his will to God. Which God? The one God, the only God. But that God is his father. He says, my father. Is Allah your father? No. Say it I, again. Allah is not no, your father? Let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. 
Do you believe before Jesus came, the Torah was corrupted? No, Jesus confirmed that it's not corrupt. The Bible says, and your Quran says, he confirmed the Torah. Why would God send Jesus after the Torah? To if... fulfill what Moses said. Because did you hear what I said? No, Jesus, Moses wrote about me. That's true. But if you think about it, if the Torah was, was, was true 100%, yeah. Everybody would be Jewish. No, because nowhere in the Torah it says be Jewish. Jewish is your ethnicity. If you're talking about religion, religion, there's difference. You can be a Jew ethnically and you can be a Christian religiously. You can be a Jew ethnically and you can be a Muslim religiously. You mean you like can a, be a Jew ethnically and be a Buddhist, right? Like a Christian Jew? When a Jew becomes Muslim, he's no longer a Jew, then what is he? He becomes a Swahili? Swahili, huh? No, I mean... In other words, you're confusing ethnicity. I mean... You are Arab ethnically. I'm Assyrian ethnically. He's a Jew ethnically, but that's not the same as religion. You can have a Jew who's a Buddhist. You have a Jew who's a Hindu. You have a Jew who's an atheist. But you're confusing ethnicity with religion. Yes, I know the religion of the Jews is called Judaism. The reason why it's called Judaism because it means the religion of the Jews. But nowhere in the Torah or in the Old Testament is the religion called Judaism. It's I don't not know. called Judaism. I always thought Jews came from a religion. Jews. They have a religion, but that religion is not called Judaism. So if you're a Jew, you have a religion. And your religion is to submit to Yahweh or Yahuwah the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God who sent Moses with the Sharia, the Torah. When you submit, that's your religion, that's your path of life. But it doesn't make it Judaism. That's not the name. So where does Judaism come from? People trying to then distinguish between the religion of other groups with the religion of Jews. So when you say Judaism, you think, oh, the religion of the Jews. Let me just real quickly tell this guy. Rodney, I'm on a live stream. I'll call you back. I'm on a live stream. I'll call you back. So the reason why it's called Judaism is so that people can all, oh, this is the religion of the Jews. You understand? But the name of the religion, if you go to the Torah, it's not called Judaism. What is it called then? There is no name given to it in the Old Testament. It's simply the covenant God made with Israel, the law God gave through Moses. So they would be worshipers of Yahweh. Those who worship Yahweh submitted to Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. But it's there is no Judaism. It doesn't say this is Judaism. Okay. I don't know why, but all my life I thought Jews was a religion. Like Ask them. No, well, see, again, they have a religion. The Jews have a religion. Right. And people call it Judaism because Judaism. it's associated with Jews. But if you ask them, say, in your Torah, your Old Testament, Tanakh, where does it say, call your religion Judaism? It's nowhere. I mean, same thing with the Bible, though. What about the Bible? Same thing with this, well, I don't know about Islam, but like in the Bible, it doesn't say Christianity. Yes, it does. It does? First Peter 4.16 says that if you suffer for being a Christian, rejoice that you bear that name. Yes, it does. We're told in the Bible that our identity, our name as a group is Christian. We are Christians. Here it is. First Peter 4, 16. And this comes from Peter, one of the Sahaba of Jesus, uh, the apostle of Jesus, who walked with Jesus and was commissioned by Jesus. Here it is. First Peter 4, 16. Yet if one suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but under that name, let him glorify God. So what name do I glorify God? Not Muslim, not Jew, Christian. 1 Peter 4.16. Okay. So the name that Jesus, the name of the religion, the religious life that God gave Jesus to give to his followers, the Father gave to the Son, is called Christian. Not Acts 11.26, you'll see. Don't try to help me. You're going to embarrass yourself. Because in Acts 11.26, it says, they were called Christian, but it doesn't tell us by who. I went to Peter, who is a Sahaba, one of the Hawadiyun that the Quran acknowledges Hawadi was inspired by Allah.
First Peter chapter four, verse 16. So don't help me, Xosi. I know you're trying to help me. Yeah, I never knew that. Yeah. Why are you called Christian? Because Christian means a follower of Christ. Now, Jesus right. said Moses wrote about him. So I want to ask you a question. If Moses wrote about Jesus, that means God revealed to Moses that this Jesus is the Messiah is coming, right? Right. And he believed in Jesus, right? Yeah. That means he's a Christian because he trusted in Christ. So they say the Torah also mentions Muhammad. Where? They call him uh, Muhammadin. Oh, that song of Solomon 516, Mahmadim. And it's not talking about a prophet. It's talking about a husband and a wife. And that the wife is saying that my husband is altogether lovely. So are you saying her husband was Muhammad? No. Well, that's what's that's the passage they're quoting. Song of Solomon 516. The wife is praising the looks of her husband. And she says he's altogether Mahmadim. So unless you believe that she was married to Muhammad before Jesus came to the earth and that Muhammad was her husband, Mahmadim does not mean Muhammad. It means someone who's lovely and desirable. Yeah, it was saying, I don't know why you say it like that. It, I thought it was pronounced Hamadin. No, it's Mayor. I'll give I'll prove it to you. Hamadin. No, that's how they want to pronounce it. The Muslims want to pronounce it Muhammadin so it can sound like Muhammad. No, no, there's no Muhammad. There's no Mo in it. It's Hamadin. No, well, I know Hamadin. Well, the one you're talking about, the one you're talking about, Song of Solomon 516, it's Mahmadin. That's the one they point to. And then the word Hamdan, Hamdan. That is the noun form of the word Muhammad, but Hamdan is not Muhammad in Arabic because Muhammad comes from Hamid, right? Yeah, Hamid. And that means praised one, praiseworthy, right? I believe so. I'm yes, it does. The word Muhammad, Ahmed, Mahmoud from Hamid means praise, praiseworthy, one that's praised. In Hebrew, the word for praise is halal, like hallelujah. Hallelujah. Halal means praise. The word Hamdam doesn't mean praised one. Mahmat doesn't mean praised one. It means one who's desirable. Okay. Now, now if you want to see how it's pronounced, here, I'll, I'll play it. I'll have someone play for it. Here you go. I'm not going to make it up. Here. Blue letter Bible. You're, they even pronounce the Hebrew. Hold on. Blue letter Bible. Let me just get it for you. Blue letter Bible. So you can hear how it's pronounced, and I'll give you the link so you can hear it on the screen. Song of Songs, this is the word, 516. Guys, I'm going to share the link with all of you. Let me just get there. Here it is, the link, and I'm going to let him. Oh, but I got to do it on the other computer. It's okay. I'll do it right here. Okay, right here. Let me do it here. I'm going to play it on my phone because here you won't hear it. All right, let's go here. Let's do this. We were saying it along. Come on, man. Here it is right here. Now watch, I want to play it. Okay, come on, buddy. Yeah. Here it goes. Tools. Let's do this. Come on, it's not working. I may have to do it over there. Okay, we got it, dude. We got it, mister. Let's do this. All right. How do we get it to speak? Okay, let me do it on the over here. It's not okay, guys. Let me just do it over here. On this uh on the not Chrome, but yeah, hold on. Now watch how it's pronounced, guys. Try to do it on my phone. Watch how it's pronounced. You ready? Sue, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, here you go. Okay, what does the word for Mahmadim? How do you pronounce it? Let's see where it is. Yeah, praise. This is my beloved. And this, okay, right here. All right. Okay, guys, listen to the pronunciation. All together. Where the heck are you, sir? Sweet. All together doesn't have it, man. Hold on. Oh, here it is. Listen. Strong's H, 4261. Mahmad. Mahmad. Okay, one more time. You listening? Did you hear that? Sue, did you hear that? I can't hear Sue. Can you guys hear me? I don't hear him. I can't hear you. Okay, so you heard what he said? Say it again. Okay, you heard how he pronounced it? No. Okay, one more time. Let me see if you can hear it. Tell me if you hear it. 
Okay, there you go. Strong's H, 4261. Mahmad. Mahmad. Did you hear that? Is it net with an N? It's Mahmad. Mahmad. Did you hear him, though? Yeah. So you heard him say, right? Mahmad. Yeah, Mahmad. So why do they say Muhammadim when it's Mahmadim? Yeah, that's kind of different. Because that's what the Muslims do to try to get people thinking it's Muhammad. See, Muhammadim. Where? It's Mahmadim. And that's plural of Mahmad. I'll play it one more time. Let me play it one more time. Here, watch here. Listen, everyone, guys, again. Here it is. Strong's H, 4261. Mahmad. Mahmad. Mahmad is not the same as Muhammad. The word Mahmad means desirable. Whereas in Arabic, Muhammad, Ahmad, Mahmud come from Hamid, meaning praised, praiseworthy. And in Hebrew, the word for praise is halal, like hallelujah. So it's not Muhammad. Yeah. That makes sense. So, no, there is no prophecy of Muhammad in the Bible. Unless you have one, we can talk about it. No, I, was, I, was, I thought that was, that was the... the that was that was the Old Testament. Yep, that was Song of Solomon. Shir Hasharim. Okay. Written by Solomon, Suleiman, alayhi said. Let's uh, talk about uh, the sins of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The what? The sins. You wanted to put a list. Oh, of yeah, yeah. You want me to show you the verses? Okay, here it goes. Uh, let me get it for you right now. Okay, where the Quran says that he sinned. And then we can go into the hadith in specific, but that's up to you. Okay, guys, he's asking me, where does the Quran say, Mom, it's in here. I'm going to, I got to line up the verses, so be patient with me. I'm done about the people listening. So let me go get them all for you. All right. Hold on one second. Let me do this. And even Allah threatens him. Did you know that? Allah threatens him. That he's, if he doesn't act right, he will kill him. Watch here. I'm going to show it to you so I don't think I'm making it up. La, 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 la. I mean, la, la, la. we're not really scared of death. Yeah, but when Allah threatens to kill you, that's not a good thing. And punish you in the afterlife, that you should be scared, no, don't you think? Different. Punishment is different. Yeah, no, but I'm talking about Allah threatens him. Here, let me show you. First one, chapter 4, verse 105. Let me just do one translation because if I do two, it's going to take. Pikthal, this is a Muslim. Muhammad Marmaduk Pikthal, a convert. So here you go. Chapter 4, verse 106 to 107. Here it is. I'm going to put it on the screen for our friend. Chapter 4, Surat the Nisa. Nada, good to see you, sister. It's been a while. Chapter 4, verse 106 to 107. Here it is on the screen. And seek forgiveness of Allah. So it's telling Muhammad, seek forgiveness of from Allah. Lo, Allah is ever forgiving. And plead, talking to Muhammad, do not plead on behalf of people who deceive themselves. Lo, Allah loveth not the one who is treacherous and sinful. So it's telling Muhammad, ask forgiveness and don't plead for the deceivers. Okay, so now watch this. Chapter 9, Surah al tawbah chapter 9, verse 43, all right? Chapter 9, verse 43. Okay, I'm going to post it on the screen. Ready? Chapter 9, verse 40, 43. Allah, forgive thee, O Muhammad. Allah, forgive thee. There it is on the screen. Hold on. So Allah forgive you for what? Wherefore didst thou? Why did you grant them leave here on before those who told the truth were manifest to thee, and thou didst know the liars? Why did you let them go until questioning them to discover who the liar is from the one speaking the truth? So Allah's telling him, Allah forgive you for what you did. You don't need to forgive him if he didn't do anything wrong, right? It says pardon you. Pardon you for what? Pardon means forgive. The word ghafur means to forgive and pardon. I pardon you for your pardon crime. You. I pardon you for your sin. Pardon can mean like excuse. No, you're trying desperate, friend. Don't mm -hmm. try. It says, hey, look, huh? Buddy, don't, don't try that. Because I, the word, when you say he's ghafur, you're saying he is forgiving. And yes, pardon. Well, if I forgive you, that means I'm pardoning you. But what is he pardoning him for? Look, he's rebuking him. Read it. Okay, let's go with pardon. Pardon you, O Muhammad. Why Allah, you, pardon you, O Muhammad. Why did why? you give permission to remain behind? You should not have until it was evident to you who were the truthful and you knew who were the liars. 
So he's rebuking them for doing something presumptuously. Yeah, but so, that, that wasn't a sin. He let them go because. So why say you're pardoned for what you did? Yeah. He's rebuking. Then, why did you grant them leave? Because why you did you? He's that speaking in anger. Well, because you didn't know that they're truth for liars. How is that? And a so sin? he made a mistake, and Allah's now rebuking him for that mistake, right? It is not a sin, my friend. Buddy, you're going to now make me go after Muhammad and show you his sins. Now, stop playing games with me, That's Sue. the first one. That's the first one. No, the first one was 4106, seek forgiveness of Allah. So now you're telling me he's just seeking forgiveness yeah. for no reason at all? Now, no, he's okay. So we're taught that Prophet Muhammad used to seek forgiveness at why? least 100 times a day. Why? And to teach us to no, seek for forgiveness. Because, no, because your Quran... Allah threatens to kill him because he was about to compromise and waver. Nice try, though. I know these tricks of the Muslims. I've been there, done that. Now, here you go. Chapter 17, 73 to 75. 17. And they indeed strove hard to beguile thee. 17. They almost deceived you. Away what? from that wherewith we have inspired thee. 17. And you should invent other than it against us. That they were going to inspire you to make up something. And then would they have accepted thee? If you did what they asked you, they would have accepted you. And I can read it more plain English, right, as a friend. And if we had not made thee holy firm, you mightest almost have inclined unto them a little. In other words, had I not stepped in, you would have gave in. Then if you did, we would make thee taste a double punishment of living and a double punishment of dying. Then you would have no helper against us. So now try to explain this away too. Can you show me where the Quran threatens Jesus this way? No, it doesn't. Can you show me in the Bible where Jesus is threatened by his father this way? No, it doesn't. Okay. Now, here is chapter 47, verse 19. Hold on, hold on. Before you move on. Yeah. So clearly here, though, 1774, God saved him from sin. Exactly. So Why would he need to save him? Because he's a man. Why would he even incline to compromise with the pagans? He's a man. He's not a... Pro I mean, oh, so thank you for proving Jesus is better than Muhammad, Muhammad under, under his feet, because Jesus never inclined for a second to compromise with unbelievers. So you just put Muhammad yeah, under Jesus' so feet. So far, Muhammad didn't sin so far. You want to bet? Now I'm going to show you Hadith, because now you're tempting me. <laughs> when he rapes people and murders them, that's not sin, right? I mean, if he's fighting a pagan non-believer... When he rapes a woman who's yeah. married and has your God justify it, that's not sin? He never raped a woman. You want to bet? Chapter 4, verse 24. Chapter 4, verse, verse 24, where your God says to the jihadis headed by Muhammad, when you take a captive woman who's married, you can have sex with her even if her husband is alive. That's called rape in everyone else's world except yours. Yeah, but... now, be, Yeah, before you get the Ebba, because now I'm going to go yeah, after Muhammad. Wait, hold on, wait, wait. Calm down. I'm going to go after Muhammad now because I have to punish Muhammad because you're trying to defend him. Oh, so I apologize. The gloves are off. Our prophet. What do you mean? Yeah, he's, well, no, he's not. He's under he, the fear of Jesus. He's, but anyway, we, we, so we, you're we, talking we, over me. I'm going to get rid of you now. I want to get you to send you to Blackstone because now you're animating. Now you're manifesting the genie that's possessing you. Oh, Listen to the argument because I'm going to show you your prophet was a pedophile rapist who's a sinner that your God threatened to kill. And he did die the way your God said he would die if he was a wicked, filthy sinner. Just be patient. Calm down. Here's another one. Janelle, explain this away. 47, 19. So know that there is no God, save Allah, and ask forgiveness for thy sin and for believing men and believing women. So Muhammad has to ask forgiveness for his sin and the sins of his followers. So now lie to me and say that when he's asking for his forgiveness of his own sins, it's not because he sinned. Because it says, ask forgiveness for your sins and their sins. So do his followers sin? You said, does his followers sin? His followers, did they sin? Of course they sinned. So you just buried yourself because if they sin, that means he sinned in order for him to ask for forgiveness. Read it. I am reading it. Okay. Forgiveness for your sin and for and? and for the believing men, men and believing women. And Allah knows of your movement and your resting place. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Did the believers around Muhammad, did they actually sin? No? You're going to say they're sinless too? No, no. I didn't say that. Okay, I, so they actually sinned? I mean, we're all, we're all, we all sin. Can you answer the question? Yes, Sue. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about time of Muhammad. Did they actually sin? 
I mean, if you have course, to think about it, I got to send you to the black stone. Logic, yes, because everybody. Okay. So that's why he has to pray, oh Allah, forgive them for their sins. That means he's not just make believe prayer. They have sin, and Allah is telling him, pray that they'll be forgiven for sins they committed. Allah, forgive them their sins, right? He's saying that Allah, forgive me and the believers. Did they actually sin for Allah to tell him now, pray that Allah will forgive them of their sins? Or is this make-believe? If it's in the Quran, it's not make-believe. So they did sin, right? Of course they sinned. That's so of course your prophet sinned. You see what you just did? Because he has to ask I, I, for his own sorry, again. From, But because yeah. God okay. did this, that doesn't mean he sinned. I mean, oh, I, I see okay. where you're wait, wait, let's go to your logic. Now let's go to logic. Now, guys, listen to the logic. This is what happens when you follow Muhammad. So when Allah tells Muhammad, pray for the forgiveness of the sins of the believing men and women, that doesn't mean they actually sin. You just pray that they'll be forgiven for sins they didn't actually commit. No, you're not going anywhere. Yes. You just buried yourself. Because you yeah. just said they actually sinned. That means when he's praying that Allah forgives them of their sins, it's because of sins they committed. Well, when he prays that Allah forgives his sins, that means he must have committed actual sins like they did. He ain't going nowhere, buddy. This verse is staying right okay. here. Show me another one. Show me another okay, but no, but you, Be honest with the text, man. No, it's saying may Allah forgive his and the believer's sins. And just like they sin, which means they need to be forgiven, he must have sinned. See? Common sense, man. Don't try hard to make him something he's not. I mean, He's, he's not awesome. Jesus. Jesus is sinless in your Quran and the Bible. He's nowhere near Jesus. So I know you want him to be like Jesus. He can't. He I can't believe Jesus. Muhammad is greater than Jesus. No, not according to the Quran. Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. That's not true. You want to bet? Okay, you want me to prove it to you? In the Quran, who's the greatest woman Allah created? Mary. Say it again. Mary. Oh, so Jesus' mother is the greatest woman, and yet Muhammad is greater than Jesus. He's According to Sahih Muslim, where is Muhammad's mother? Muhammad's mother died when he was... Where is Amina? According to Sahih Muslim, I have the hadith right here. You, what do you mean, where is she? she? She died. Where is his mother and father? Your prophet said they're in hell. Who said that? Your prophet said his father's in hell, and when your prophet went to pray for his mother... Allah said, do not pray for her forgiveness. Where does it say that? I'm going to say it to you. So I'm going to now use the Quran to show that Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. Because you said he's greater than Jesus. He's not good enough to lick Jesus' sandals. But I'm going to show it to you from your Quran. I'm not even going to use the Bible. Let me get you the Hadith. Okay. Your prophet was weeping because when he went to the grave of his mother, he asked Allah to forgive her. And he said, do not ask for her forgiveness. And then he told another man, my father, Abdullah, and your father are in hell. Okay, well, let me show it to you. They probably were. They what? I said Muhammad's father probably was. Uh, and what about his mother? Possibly. Okay, so wait. You just told me Muhammad is greater than Jesus, and yet Jesus' mother is the greatest woman that Allah created. Why? Because she had because what? this birth. What does the birth have to do with Mary becoming the greatest of all women? Without Jesus, Mary is not great. Thank you. You just buried yourself. Yeah, Sue. What do you In mean? other words, because of Jesus, Mary became the greatest. Well, the only way she can be the greatest if he's the greatest. Thank you, Sue. I see what you're saying. I Thank see you. From. You got it now? I see where you're coming from. Uh, no, you just, I used your logic. What was your logic? Your logic was? Yeah, but Muhammad is great. Jesus made Mary Muhammad the is greatest great. woman, but Muhammad made his mother an inhabitant of hell. So Muhammad made his parents burn in hell. So let's go to your logic. So his parents died by the time he was six. What has that got to do with anything? Why didn't Allah do for Muhammad what he did for Jesus? Why? He, what he did here, for here's the hadith. Why didn't Allah do for Muhammad what he did for Isa? Why didn't he make Amina a believer and the greatest of all women? Because. Because she, what? They lived in a pagan in no, because Isaac. according to your hadith, there were the Hunafa, like Waraka bin Nofl. They knew the path because they knew about Christianity and Judaism. Don't give me that garbage. Doesn't work. There are pagans. Doesn't matter. Why didn't Allah guide her like he guided Waraka bin Nofl to the right path? Because even before Muhammad, according to your Islamic tradition, the Hunafa, 
They were there before Muhammad, and they were guided on the right deen, and they renounced paganism. Why didn't your God do that for Amina like he did it for Jesus' mother? What? Who's the Hunafat? The Hunafar, Waraka bin Nofal, Zayd ibn Amr, the people who found the correct deen before Muhammad. In your Bukhari, when Khadija wanted to confirm Muhammad wasn't demon possessed, it says she took him to her cousin, Waraka bin Nofal, who in the days of Jahiliyyah became a Christian and wrote the gospel, and he confirmed that Amus came to him. And it says in your tradition, there was a group of them, the Hunafa, who left the paganism of the Kaaba and follow the true deen. So why didn't Allah do that for Muhammad's mother? What was the true deen? Following the path of the prophets, not the idolatry of the pagans. I just explained it to you. Yeah. Answer no, the question. That. Why didn't he do that for Amina? I don't know. That's a question you're going to have to ask. Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. Because I'm going to go by your logic, your words. I'm going to show you the hadith. Let's the go by your reason, words. The only reason why I say Jesus is lesser than Muhammad is for two things. We, be, we believe Muhammad is the most beloved to God. That's the that's one. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Okay, I'm just Jesus saying, I'm just saying that's what we believe. And the second thing is uh, Prophet Muhammad is actually going to be the only prophet out of all the prophets to, uh, to take away from our bad deeds. Or not take away from our bad deeds. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Just because you think he told you that means nothing. Because what I'm showing you is Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus from the Quran. Now, let me show you here. Here's the hadith. Muslim, just listen. Be patient, man. Because you said Muhammad is greater than Jesus, which is the most blasphemous thing you can say in light of the way he lived. But let's go with here. Sahih Muslim, I gave you the link. Abu Huraira reported. The apostle of Allah visited the grave of his mother and he wept. And he wept and moved others around him to tears and said, I sought permission from my Lord to beg forgiveness of her, but it was not granted to me. I begged Allah, oh Allah, forgive my mother. He said, no. And this is the most beloved to Allah, making him cry at the fact that his mother died and he didn't forgive her. And I sought permission to visit her grave and it was granted to me. So visit the graves for that makes you mindful of death. This is Sahih Muslim. Here's the link. I'm going to show it to you. So I want to repeat your words. It's recorded. The reason why Mary's the greatest is because Jesus made her great. Well, if she's the greatest woman, because Jesus, that means he must be the greatest man. But your prophet Muhammad couldn't even make his parents great because they're in hell. According to Bukhari, here, and Muslim. Here's Muslim. There it is. He was, Click a, kid. On it. He was a kid when they died. Buddy, you don't, you don't get it. Let me repeat it again. Maybe it's not clear the first 10 times. What? So what? I, he I could have guided Amina and Abdullah to be God-fearing Hunafa, he could have saved them out of paganism like he did Waraka bin Nofal before your prophet became a prophet. Why did he do that for them? Yeah, you have no answer. It's okay. Nobody because has Muhammad is nothing in comparison to Jesus. But now let me show you where his father is. You want to see where his father is? Who's? Muhammad's father. Here you go. Muhammad's father. Here you go. This is the link right there. I'm going to put it in private chat. This is from Muslim website, not mine. It's Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim, again, Sahih. And I'm going to play Sheikh Asim al-Hakim. Sheikh Asim al-Hakim about Muhammad's parents being in hell. He's a Salafi Muslim who loves Muhammad. I'm going to play him now. Just hold on. Anas reported, verily a person said, messenger of Allah, where is my father? He said, he is in the fire. When he turned away, he called him and said, Verily, my father and your father are in the fire. So Muhammad said, my father is in hell and my mother is in hell. Now, can I play Sheikh Asim al-Hakim saying your prophet's parents are in hell and they had no excuse because they knew no. about the true deen? Yeah, no. I, I mean, that's... Can I play him, though? Yeah. I want to hear him. Okay. I like when he says it better than I say it because he does a good job. I want to hear somebody else say it. No, he's a Muslim. He's a Salafi. He's got a show where he answers question. Here it is. He's he's not a joke. Yeah. Ask him. Just can I, I want to play Hakim, Hakim, Prophet, parents. Yeah, but I mean, what's the? But I want to hear it. Look, but be, see, this patient's gonna kill you. I want the Christians to hear. You're one of your Muslim scholars admitting your Muhammad's parents are in hell. Here it is. Are we ready? Here. Here it goes. 
Fourth question is, why are the parents of the Prophet ﷺ in hell? This question you do not ask me about. Listen. This question is something that the Prophet himself والسلام, told us about and the hadith is in Sahih al Imam Muslim. Question. I'm sorry. His father is a man came to him and said, O Prophet of Allah, where is my father? So the Prophet said, والسلام, Your father is in hell. How did the Prophet know? Allahumma salli wa sallam alayhi. Because Allah told him. So the man did not feel well about the answer. The Prophet said to him, your father and my father are in hell. And in another hadith, the Prophet wept one day, so they asked him, why are you weeping? He said, I sought permission from Allah to seek forgiveness for my mother. And he denied me from seeking forgiveness for her, which means that in accordance to the ayah in Surah at tawbah that the Prophet and the believers are not permitted to seek forgiveness for those who died on idol worshipping, even if they were next of kin. End of story. Now, this was the Prophet's fatwa, alayhi salatu wasalam, not mine, fatwa. not Sheikh XYZ. It was from the Prophet himself, alayhi And it's not in a dubious book. It's in Sahih. Al Imam Muslim, for the most authentic book alongside with the Bukhari after the Quran. So, why this is not our issue or problem? Because this is from Allah Azza wa Jal. It's a revelation. You can say that maybe because the people of Mecca Listen. had the religion of Ibrahim. Did you hear it? He's now going to refute you. Listen to your scholar. They had no excuse to be idolaters. Because yeah. they knew the religion of Abraham, they could have embraced it. Listen, look what he's going to say. Listen, not me. Why they were performing Hajj, they were doing Tawaf, and they had the original religion of Ibrahim of worshipping Allah on Tawheed. And his son, Ismail, was their forefather. And there was the religion of Judaism and Christianity, which they had could have adopted anyone. Oh. So these religion of monotheism were there, mm -hmm. but they failed to choose it so those who failed to choose it would end up in hell this might be a reason i don't know what i know is what the prophet said to us we have to believe and comply and allah knows. so he just refuted your excuse he said they knew about the religion of abraham they can embrace it and there was judaism christianity they could embrace it they chose not to and the fatwa of your prophet is his mother's in hell and his father's in hell but jesus's mother is the greatest woman your God created. It's that, and you're still trying to tell me Muhammad is greater than Jesus. God forbid such blasphemy. Now you want me to continue to show you why Jesus is better than Muhammad? From your Quran and Hadith, not from the Bible. Um, I wanted to find more sins about Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. So far we really didn't see any sins. Well, yeah, you saw it because he said, Allah told him, ask forgiveness for your sins. That means he actually committed sins. Just like his followers committed sins, but you try to tap them and surround them. No, but no, now I'm no. going to ask you, or and I'm going to show you that he was a sinner. Okay, I'm going to ask you. Now be uh, because you're being recorded. Anything you say, you're going to answer before the true God on the day of judgment, and it's recorded. Okay. Right. Now I want you to be honest because I'm going to show you why Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. Don't be upset. Everyone's under the feet of Jesus. Right. Everybody. I'm under the feet of Jesus. You're under the feet of Jesus. Right. Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus because he's the Son of God, who's the Lord of creation. But. Here's I'm going to ask you, and I want you to be honest. Even though you believe it's abrogated, if you were living at the time Muhammad, be honest with me. I don't want you to lie. Fear God, because you believe you're going to stand before him. And Muhammad's companions came, or Muhammad came. Your mother's a widow, or your sister's not married, or your grandmother's not married. And they say, we're going to do muta. I'm going to marry your mother for three days, and then divorce her and pay her. What do you call that? What do you call that? That's prostitution. You just called your prophet a prostitute because he allowed Zawaj al Muta. Don't lie. Don't look, try to tap them. Look, look, look. So 
I did hear this in the Shi'i religion, but in the Sunni religion. No, it's in the Sunnah, your Prophet in Bukhari and Muslim. I'm going to give you the hadiths based on Surah Al Maida 587. He allowed Muta, then abrogated it. So I'm not saying you do it till this day. I'm saying at the time your Prophet, when you as a Sunni believe he allowed it, then he canceled it later. So I'm not saying you do it today. That's why I asked you. If you're living at the time of your prophet and he had made it halal, acceptable, what do you call your prophet and his companion saying, go find a woman, marry her for three days, two days, doesn't matter, pay her and divorce her. You just called it prostitution. So you just called your prophet a prostitute. You mean a pimp? He's a pro Okay, let's be nice. A pimp. Okay, so you're okay with him being a pimp? No, because he's not a pimp. Oh, so you mean when they do that to... Someone's mother or sister, they're not treating her as a whore. Yeah, that's what I thought. How old is your daughter? God bless her, preserve her. She's new, new. Bless new, new. Okay, I have a, a, a Sunni Muslim. He wants to arrange marriage with your daughter. He's around 50 years old. He wants to now write a contract with you that your daughter will be my wife. And when she's nine, I'm going to marry her and consummate the marriage. Yes or no? 2024, no. But hold on. Your prophet is a role model and the Sharia is for all time. Are you saying that's outdated? Because it's research. Uh, in the 1800s in America, they allowed 10 year olds to get married. Last time I checked, America wasn't a prophet from God, but your prophet is, right? No, no, that's true. But I'm just going with civil. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So you're going to use the corrupt. Sharia of the Kufar to justify the filth of your prophet. I not thought your prophet's not at all. I'm just saying people thought it was normal even 200 years. But didn't Allah know it's not normal? I thought Allah knows everything. What do you mean he does know everything? So did he not know it's not normal for a 54 year old to sleep with a nine year old because physically, psychologically, will damage her? So your God didn't know that. I mean, it probably was normal back in the day. So, but you didn't answer my question. You first said, "Well, okay. people Take thought this. it's normal." But I like thought this. Allah knows that. Hold on, buddy. Let me make my point because you're tap dancing. Okay. I thought Allah knows everything and he knows the design of the body. And he knows for a young girl at nine, she is physically premature and psychologically premature to have a grown man, 54, old enough to be her grandfather, with an erect penis penetrating her. Did Allah know that or no? Of course. He knew that. Okay. And he allowed your prophet to do it. And he allows it in the Quran, 65 verse 4. And you still want to insult me and say, this man's better than my Jesus? How am I insulting God you? Forbid, because you're telling me this man is greater than Jesus. God forbid the insult. You see why we Christians hate your prophet and we get angry? Hate this is, man you're going to compare to Jesus. Hate, hate is a strong word. No, it says, do I not hate those who hate you? Do you hate Satan or do you love Satan? I hate Satan. You hate what? Satan. Oh, but that's a strong word. No, but that's Satan. Jesus teaches you. Yeah, but then you have agents of, because your Quran says there are human shayateen. Chapter 6, verse 1 or 12. But you have even humans that are devils. That's true. But according to Christians, it says not to fight flesh, but to fight the spirit. Exactly. But we also rebuke and hate those who are giving themselves over to Satan instead yeah. of repenting. That's Psalm 139, 19 Jesus, to 22. Jesus doesn't teach that. You want to bet he does? Now, don't change subject. Like how you ran. Good. Let's run back. I like how you ran, the runner. Come back to the issue. So you just condemned your prophet for being a pimp, and you condemned him for doing something that Allah knew would damage the nine-year-old. What do you mean it didn't damage her? He left her a widow at the age of 18. Aisha. He couldn't. Did she have children with him? No. Did he have, did he, was he able to get any of the other wives pregnant? He got uh, Khadija pregnant. That's before, and even that's debatable, the Shia denied. But could he get her pregnant, Who? Aisha? Possibly. Where? She, you mean what? The baby died? So no. Muhammad, you're telling me, she didn't took a nine-year-old, couldn't get her pregnant, left her a widow at 18, so she couldn't marry and have children with anyone else, and she dies years later in her old age all by herself. And you're saying that didn't do any damage to her. Time out, time out, Uncle Sam. Hold on real quick. Well, don't call me Uncle. Well, before you ask me, I want to ask this. Let's say Aisha was your daughter. 
be honest with me. Your look, daughter, look, the one that you love. Well, I'm not. Let me make the point that you can ask me. Let me just make the point. Right now, if 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 it no, was, no, 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 no. Let's go to the time, Muhammad. You're at the time, Muhammad. Yeah. Your daughter. Yeah. You want me to make the? Can I make the point? You just said, yeah, you buried yourself. Let me just make the point before you say and embarrass yourself live. Okay. Let me make the point. Okay. You're living at the time, Muhammad. Your beautiful little angel, that little angel, whether it's Muhammad or Abu Bakr, they want to now marry her when she's nine, when she's nine, and they're in their 40s and 50s. They marry her. They die, leaving her a widow. In the case of Muhammad, let's take Muhammad. He then leaves your daughter a widow at 18. She can never marry. I want you to say I'd be okay with that. Two things. No, say I'll be okay with it. You said yes. One, two things, two things. One, one, we're actually encouraged to marry widows in Islam. That's not what I asked you. See, you're, you're... I'm just saying. No one could marry Muhammad's wives. The reason why Aisha didn't get married was. No, the Quran says you can't marry Muhammad's wives. That's in the Quran. It's out of respect. It's not. No, it's because Muhammad said they're your mothers. In his world, they're your mothers. So he made up this rule so you don't touch them. So don't change the subject, my friend. Get to the point. If your but, prophet married your nine-year-old at that time, you're living at that time, and he left her a widow at 18, no children, to die a widow, no children, I want you to say, I'm okay with my prophet doing that to my daughter. I want it recorded. He said, I want it recorded. Look, because it is recorded. Look, I want to hear it. I want people to see what Islam does. Can say I, it. That question. You so can't even answer it. Yep. You can't. Your, your heart is convicting you. That's no, a spirit. Because every man will say no. You know. Say it again? Every man will say what? No. This day and age, this day and no, age, I, okay. every, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna this, repeat it a third time. Let me continue at the Muhammad, time of your prophet marrying Aisha at the time that he did. Not a single scholar, not a single Christian, not a single man. You're rose, lying through your teeth. Rose an argument. I will, you're lying through teeth because I have hadiths where when Omar ibn al Khattab wanted to marry Um Kulthum, she was around 10 and 11. The daughter of Ali, Ali said, she's too young for you. Stop lying to me, man. I know your tradition. But before you run there, before you run there, you at least honestly said, no, no man would want that, especially today. Forget today. Let's go you, back to the time you're prophet. You're there, seventh century. You cannot, with the with the wisdom and knowledge that we have now, you cannot oh. say. So guys, he just showed you put modern technology. In well, let me repeat what you said. Did you hear what he said? He just said, with our knowledge today, we just proved Allah is an ignoramus. He's really Satan because if Allah knew everything, he would know that technology would catch up to the Quran and showing how evil this is. So thank you for destroying no, the Quran. I'm saying a long time ago, girls got married at 10 and 11. And did Allah know that would be bad back then? It's not bad. We're the people. Oh, it's okay. We're it's good. Humans. Time out. We're the humans that made it bad. But did Allah know it's bad? And could he have stopped it like he stopped adoption? It's not bad. A girl getting married when she hits maturity is not bad. Your hadith says she wasn't mature. She was still playing with dolls because she hadn't reached puberty. Stop, look, yeah, please I mean, stop look, lying to me. Look, yeah, uncle, yes. look, look. Right so no, now, wait, wait. I'm going right. to throw you out if you don't listen. Listen, because now you're running. Did Allah know that a 54-year-old sleeping with a nine-year-old would be bad for her because later on, modern technology would confirm. Did he know that, yes or no? Did he know it was bad? It's not bad. It's not bad, it's okay. So you'd be okay for a 54-year-old to mount your daughter and have sex with her. Look, man, I yeah. told you, this day and age, you can't ask that question. Yeah. You know I'm going to block you because you keep repeating this. I didn't yeah. say this it's age. The truth, Sam. So you want me to get you out of here because you're wasting my time now? How am I wasting your time? Because you keep saying this day and age, and I asked the question, I'm going to ask it the fifth time. Did Allah know back then that of today, can I finish the point? Today in the 21st century, science would confirm this is not healthy or good for a nine-year-old. Did he know that back then? Yes or no? Did he know it? Yeah. Yes, he did. Okay. So did Allah abolish adoption, which is good? Did he stop adoption? Yeah. So now notice, listen to yourself. This is recorded. Go back and listen. So I want everyone here. Allah stopped adoption, which is good, in the 7th century. And Allah knew that today science, 21st century, would show it is not healthy good for a 54-year-old to mount a 9-year-old. But that he didn't stop. He allowed it. And you don't see the problem. 
For you, man. Hold on, bro. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That's what I thought. For you. I feel what, bad for you. That's what I Seriously. thought. But even that's what I thought. Like I said, back in the day, girls got married at a very young age. Okay, let, let's go to something else because you're you just refuted that today, very point. Today, did Allah today, know? Today, did Allah know back then that when you get married to a young girl, it was not healthy for them? You said yes, he knew that. So stop repeating that argument. Let's go to something else. You want to have a conversation? Because oh, you just destroyed your religion. With, let me just end it with this. Today, this day and age, 18-year-old girls don't get married because they're too young. Okay. So but but go, Allah know. Go and have like, should I send this guy to Mecca? Because he's wasting time. I'm going to give you another chance. So, yeah, I'm going to give you another chance. Did you not just say, did you, we got you recorded. Allah even knew back then in the seventh century, he knew back then what we now found today, 21st century, that a 54-year-old sleeping with a nine-year-old, it's not healthy for her. You said, yes, he knew it. That means if Allah really cared for children, he would say to the people, the hell with you and your practice. Don't do that like he stopped the adoption. Why did he stop adoption when it was good, but he didn't stop this when this was evil? Can you answer that question? Why did he stop adoption? He canceled adoption, which is humane, but he didn't stop this practice, which you even admit harms a young girl. Why? Why stop a good practice, but not stop this evil practice? Because for one, for one, adoption leads to... Other things. That's why they stopped it. What's, what other question do you have? I don't want you to embarrass yourself. It's okay. You already did damage. So what's the next question you have? Go ahead, Suhail. Um, what's the next question? All right. Let's move on then, I guess. Yeah, I mean, because I don't want – because you, you, uh, you, when you go back and listen to yourself, the spirit will convict you. You'll see. You're going to say, wow. When we're done, go back listen to this. By yourself, close the door. Listen, you're going to see how embarrassing this religion is. But go ahead. What's your next question? I mean, humility is a part of what my religion teaches me, so... No, not at all. Your religion doesn't teach you. It teaches you dominance. I mean, so you keep telling me that it's like if I don't know your religion. I've studied your religion, dude. I know what I your religion is. I think you know it, but you have a different perspective of it. You have your own perspective. I have the right perspective, Jesus' perspective. That's what's how I know it's evil. What's right? What's right? What's wrong? Jesus said, I am the truth. So that's how I know what right is. I am the yeah. truth. All right, here comes my next question to you. Yeah. So if someone lived a life without knowing Jesus, didn't never heard of Christianity, how is God going to judge them? God will judge them by the revelation that they did receive and how they responded. That's in Acts 17, 16 to 31. That's in Acts 14, 8 to 18. So God will look into their circumstances, see what they knew, what they did not do know, and how they responded. And also God knows something we don't. God knows if that person heard the gospel, whether he accepts it or not. So let's say God knows this person, if someone preached the gospel, he would still reject it. See, God also knows that. Right. But you can ask that question of yourself. What about those who've never heard of Muhammad? What happens to them? Nothing. People Nothing? So believe that you don't have to be Muslim to go to heaven. You could still go to heaven. But How? What do you mean how? By being a good person. So we believe 70% of of going to heaven is being a good person. And so I can reject Muhammad and say he's an antichrist and live a good moral life and I go to heaven? I mean, rejecting him and then calling him the antichrist. Those two well, he is. I mean, my religion, he is. Yeah, I'll give you an example. In your religion, Joseph Smith. He's the founder of Mormonism. He comes after Muhammad, and he claims to be a true prophet. Is he a false prophet or a true prophet? Joseph, and let me repeat it again. Joseph Smith, he comes after Muhammad, 1800s. He starts a church called Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he claims to be a prophet, and the angel Moroni came to him and gave him the book, the Book of Mormon. He comes after Muhammad. Is he a true prophet or a false prophet? He may be a messenger. He's not a prophet. So you're telling me when he claims to be a prophet, he doesn't know he's talking about. And secondly, you're telling me that Muhammad is not the last messenger according to your tradition? He is the last prophet. Is he the last messenger? I think so. 
Let me hold on. Well, according to Sunni tradition, he's the last prophet and last messenger. The last prophet. I don't know about the last messenger. Well, that's why I ask your scholar. He's the last messenger and prophet. They don't accept anyone after. But anyway, he said he's a prophet, not a messenger. And he contradicts Muhammad. Joseph Smith says Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But there are three gods. And he's a prophet. And that he came to restore the church. Is he a true prophet or no? No, of course not. Okay, so would you call him a false prophet? Yeah. So why do you get upset when I say Muhammad is an antichrist false prophet? Because when he comes after Jesus and he contradicts the Bible that I have. He didn't come after Jesus. Yes, he did. Muhammad, what, love, Muhammad was before Jesus? We are taught to love Jesus. And Joseph Smith is taught to love Jesus too. Yeah, but that man worships him. That's the difference. Okay, let's go with the Baha'i. Let's play your game. Baha'i. Baha'u'llah and the Bab. In Iran, who claim to be Muslim, they started the Baha'i faith. They don't worship Jesus. They love Jesus and believe Muhammad is a messenger. Are they true prophets or false prophets? False. Oh, but wait, they respect and love Muhammad in the Quran. Okay. What are you trying to get at? What I'm trying to get at is your argument you love Jesus, it's garbage because you don't love the real Jesus. You have a fake Jesus that you think is the real Jesus. Just like Baha'u'llah and the Bab, the ba they claim Muhammad is a prophet, the Quran is the revelation of Allah, but that Baha'u'llah is the glory of Allah sent with an additional revelation. And he spent all his life in prison. But would you say he's a true prophet? No. Why? But he says he Muhammad, we miracles? love Muhammad, Rasulullah. Did he have any miracles? Muhammad had no miracles according to the Quran. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. The Quran says he had none. Muhammad was sinless. So I saw him. You want me to now repeat the whole hour discussion of the verses that Barry Dune showed that he wasn't sinless? You, I told you, let's keep going. You said that. I don't know what happened. So Coming back to the issue, Muhammad had no miracles according to the Quran. So your hadiths, they made up miracles to make him look better. Your Quran says he had no miracles. I mean, Islam spreading of itself is a miracle. Yes, by spreading, by beheading people, raping That's women, and enslaving them. That's not true. You want me to play Sheikh Asim Halkim admitting that Islam spread by the sword? How about this? The Jews don't believe in uh, Jesus. They no, could, that's not true. They think he's a false prophet. Yeah, that's not true, dude. I yeah. there are hundreds of thousands of Jews that worship Jesus as God. One of them is Dr. Michael L. Brown. What are you talking about? He's not a true Jew. Why? Because you said so? No, because yeah. no. Michael Brown is a Jew that worships Jesus as Lord and Savior. So he's Christian. How is he Jewish? See again now. So yeah, I'm trying to be nice to you, but this is what happens. Muhammad makes you stupid. I think you want to be illiterate like him. Did you forget the conversation that a Jew is someone ethnically, not religiously, or is that kissing the black stone damage your brain? I did kiss the black stone, so maybe. You did kiss it, right, when you did Hajj? I did Umrah. Yeah, you did Umrah. Okay, so, so you did. Now, guys, he admitted. He went Umrah and he kissed the black stone like yeah, a good thing. It was from Abraham. Prove it it's from Abraham, dude. What do you mean? Him and his sons put it there. Prove it. Give me some pre-Islamic archaeological Did you proof. say that the Abrahamic religion was there? And no, I don't say that. Your prophet and is Amina, full of him. He's a liar. Amina and Sayyidah Muhammad prophet. There is father. no proof Abraham was in Mecca. Give me the you, proof. You just said it yourself. You said not too long ago. I'm that, going to insult your prophet if you lie about me. It's recorded. Okay. I've never said I'm Abraham. not lying. You said that Abraham. No, Sheikh Asim al-Hakim said it because he's stupid like you who believes oh, Muhammad. Uh, I didn't say it. How are you going to use that and then start saying that? Because that's he's a Salafi, and like you, he believes your fake tradition. So does your tradition say that Abraham established the Kaaba there? Yes. Yeah. So did Amina and Abdullah know that supposedly this Kaaba was started by Abraham? Yeah, they did. So I'm going by your sources. I crap on your sources because they're full of lies. So give me some pre-Islamic proof. Yeah, I'm being honest. Give me some pre-Islamic proof. Archaeology, not hadith, where it says Abraham and Ishmael were in the Kaaba. Where, where was where was where was uh, Abraham from? Abraham was not in Arabia. Don't change the subject. Give me proof that Abraham went to Mecca with Ishmael to build the Kaaba. Pre-Islamic proof, not hadiths. Give me some I'm, proof. I'm just telling you. I'm just asking you. Where is where is Prophet Abraham? Abraham? Came from Ur of Chaldee. 
and he settled in Canaan. Modern modern day, where is he from? Iraq, and then what you would call Palestine. That's why there's a person I'm from Palestine. I'm Palestinian. Okay. What you call it, because at that time wasn't called Palestine. Okay, but it was not too long ago. So you want to claim yourself to be a descendant of the Canaanites who are an abomination to God? More power to you. That means you're all the more proof you're a pagan. But coming back to the issue, don't change the subject. Can you give me proof Abraham went to Mecca and Ishmael was in Mecca and built the Kaaba? Pre-Islamic evidence. I'm not asking for your hadith that comes later. I'm asking for evidence before Muhammad, even before Jesus, archaeological proof. Abraham went to Mecca and Ishmael settled in Mecca. I can try to look for some. You can look for it. It's not there, man. I'm telling you. So why do the why do the Jews put that that black rock on their head? <laughs> Go ask them. That's a phylactery because it contains Bible verses. What does that got to do with Moses? What does that got to do with Joshua? What does that got to do with Israel? What does that got to do with Isaac? The rabbinic Jews are just as much pagan as you guys are. What are you not getting? They don't follow the Old Testament. They perverted it. That's what I've been trying to establish to you. Do you believe that God has a symbol? What symbol? I don't know what you mean, symbol. What symbol? Do you what believe kind of... there's a symbol for God? What do you mean by symbol? Be specific. I can't answer a general like question. Like a cross, a symbol. A cross. Well, that cross, that's a symbol of what Jesus did on the cross. Yeah? So you believe that God has a symbol? I don't know what you mean. Not a black stone that you lick like a pagan, no? I mean, I don't worship the black stone. But well, why you, do you kiss it? You do worship the, the cross. No, I don't. You're you're full of crap. I kiss the cross as <clears throat> honoring <laughs> Jesus who died. But now I'm going to bury you. But be patient. I know what you're going to say, dude. I know what you're going to say. Tell me why you kissed the black stone. What did the black stone do for you? The black stone is just the direction for us to pray. Oh, when I kiss the cross, it's like me kissing a picture of my mother. I'm kissing the cross to honor Jesus who died on the cross. So that's my reason. But what reason do you have to kiss the black stone? What the hell did the black stone do for you? That's the direction we pray. Why does Allah require you to kiss a black stone? But you don't have to. You want to bet it's sunnah. Your prophet did it, and he says you sunnah do it. Not requirement. Sunnah. What? A sunnah. The sunnah is not required. You want to bet that if you perform umrah or hajj, that one of the a hundred dollars. Even though I'm not supposed to bet. Okay, you want to bet? If I quote you Fiqh Sunnah, quoting Bukhari and Muslim, where it is one of the rites that you must do, if there is a large crowd, then you have to just symbolically reach out your hand and kiss your hand. But if there's room, you have to go kiss the stone and put your cheek on it. This is part of the rites of pilgrimage, according to your prophet. Are you trying to deceive me? No, not at all. Okay, so again, why did your prophet make you kiss a black stone when even Umar ibn al-Khattab said, when he went to kiss it, he goes, I know that you're a stone that neither harms nor benefits. Had I not seen the Messenger of Allah doing it, doing it, I would not have done it. Why? What do you mean why? I told you. Today. Why does your prophet make you kiss a black stone? For what reason? When I kiss the cross, hear me out, it's because I'm showing honor to my Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that through the cross you saved me. Is that why you're kissing black stone? Because the black stone will save you. The black stone is our is we say it's the universal uh, center of the universe. Okay. What if I tell you, according to your prophet, your black stone will come on the day of judgment and will defend you and make Allah forgive you? I never heard of that. So, but okay. Well, before I show you that, what if I show you from the sound a hadith? Your prophet said that black stone will come to life with eyes and a mouth, and it will fight for you and intercede for you, making Allah forgive you. I know that the only person that intercedes for me on the day of judgment is Prophet Muhammad. You're going to answer the question. See, this is why we're getting frustrated. Okay, I'm going to ask it a third time. Okay, I'm going to see. I like threes. Okay. Gosh. What if I show you from the sound Sahih Ahadith that your prophet said the black stone will have eyes and a mouth, and it will intercede and fight for you and make Allah forgive you? What are you going to say about your prophet? Are you going to say he's a pagan? No. Uh, Why not? Because the pagans said the same thing. In your Quran, the pagans told your prophet, the reason why we worship the stones and the idols is so that they can bring, bring us near to Allah. That's in chapter 39, verse 3 of your Quran. Read it. 39, verse 3, it says that the only reason why we worship them is so that they can bring us near to Allah. 
because by honoring them, we're hoping they will intercede and bring us closer to Allah. That's exactly what your prophet said the black stone will do. You said 39. So you're no better than the pagans. 39.3? Yes, read it. Unquestionably for Allah is the pure religion. And those who take protectors besides him say we only worship them that they may bring us nearer to Allah in position. Indeed, Allah Why do they worship them? What's that? Why did the pagans worship the statues and the stones? We only worship them that they may bring us near to Allah in position. Ah, but guess what? How did they worship the stones and the idol? They would kiss it. They would put their face on it. And one of them was the black stone. So Muhammad condemns them for doing that. But then he has you pagans doing the same thing. No, because the 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 things, the idol, whatever you want to call them, were inside the Kaaba. Not yeah. all of them. They were not. No. Well, I mean, there's one some says outside. that the statue of Hubal was outside on the top. There's some outside, but for the most part, they're all inside. Can you forget trying to say because you just admit even outside? Do you understand why they did it? Let's try the logic again. Yeah. So Allah could be. So what's the difference between those pagans and you pagans when you're doing the same thing? Because we're not worshiping the stone, we're worshiping. Yes, you are. When you kiss it and you put your cheek on it, that's exactly what the pagans did to their idols and stones for the same reason. Because your prophet says, when you kiss it and you put your cheek on it, it will come to life and defend you before Allah. Oh Allah, He used to lick me and smooch me, so forgive him. You're no different than the pagans, dude. I guess. Here, here let me show it to you. Here it is. So you're a pagan. You don't worship one god. You're a pagan. You have many gods. Here's one. Here's the link. Oh, right here. Sunnah. Well, can you click on it so you don't think I'm lying here? Not my lord. Well, that makes it even worse. So you're smooching and smothering a stone that's not your lord. Don't you understand? You're bearing yourself even more. So you're going to smooch the black stone that's not your lord, and you because still don't think you're a pagan. As I kissed a rock, I worship it now. Okay, let's try this again. The pagans would kiss the stones and the idols, and they would actually touch the stones and idols because they believe these idols and stones, representing their gods, would intercede for them. Your prophet said that black stone that you touch and kiss, it will come to life and intercede for you. So it's no different from the pagans. What are you not getting? I see where you're coming from, but what you're not understanding is them kissing those stones, those, those idols, they believed that those were gods. Sure, that's okay. But they didn't think they were Allah. They thought they would bring them closer to Allah. So you don't call it a god, but you're doing the same thing. I'm going to slick this black stone because it's going to bring me closer to Allah. That's so idolatry. We, we, we do believe as Muslims that everything on the Day of Judgment will come to life. Trees. But that's okay. I'm, I'm fine. Here it is. It was later that Rock, Sayyid bin Jubair. You want to read the hadith? Mountains. Or? Everything will be alive. You want me to read the hadith? It is. It was narrated that Sayyid bin Jubair said, I heard Ibn Abbas, Muhammad's cousin, the Messenger of Allah, this stone will be brought on the day of resurrection and will be given two eyes with which it sees and a tongue with which to speak and will bear witness for those who touch it in sincerity. So it's going to be your intercessor. And it's great Hassan. Hassan, good. Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2944. I gave you the link. So, and you're trying to convince us you guys are not pagans. Okay, I'm convinced. I mean, we're 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 kissing. Okay, we kiss the rock. How does that make us pagan? We don't worship the rock. Because the pagans did the same thing. They would kiss stones, thinking that kissing these stones would bring them closer to Allah. They were they for them. those stones. There's a difference. And when you kiss a stone and you touch it, hoping that it will save you, then you're doing the same thing, even though you don't like to use the word. Even Omar, didn't you say Omar ibn Khattab? The yes. Doesn't do anything. We already know this. The stone okay, but you, let me repeat again. You may not use the word worship. You can deny all you want. It's not worship. What you say, you contradict by your deeds. You may say I'm not worshiping it, but by your action, when you kiss it and touch it, hoping it will take your sin and defend you, that is worship because you're depending on it to intercede for you. That's what a God is. Someone who comes to help you and defend you that's what an ilah is i don't know so if you know that believe that muhammad intercedes for us on the day of judgment we don't i just gave God. you the hadith the black stone will also intercede for you yeah but i you, just gave it to you 
you just said that a uh, God intercedes. That's what you just. Let me now tell you that uh, Muhammad is your other God. That's the other pagan God that you worship. We we don't worship Muhammad. Peace you do by your deeds. Don't change the song. I'm going to show you that you worship Muhammad. You're a Muhammad, and I'll prove it. Your God is Allah, Muhammad, the black stone, the Quran. They're all your gods. I'll prove it. But uh, before uh, we get to Muhammad as your God, do you are you okay with a stone coming to life and interceding for you and defending you, which, which is what an Ilah does? Why do you think they worship them as gods? Because they are our protectors and defenders. So you may not call it a god. You may not call it worship, but when you're kissing it to honor it and touching it to revere it and trusting that it will defend you, that's what an idol is, an ilah, a god is. So on the day of judgment, we believe that even our own hands bear witness against us. Your feet bear witness against you. So do I need to kiss your hands and then touch it so that your hands come to life to then defend me against Allah? Is that no. what you're asking me to do? What I'm telling you is God sees everything through. I didn't, that, don't change the subject. The black stone will defend you and make Allah forgive you for your do you, sin. Do you know why the black stone forgives us? Yeah, because Muhammad is a pagan. No, it's because it's a rock. Yeah, so this is your brain. So going back to what I said this earlier. This is your brain on, on, on a rock. See, when you get stoned, this is what it does to your brain. So you're stoned. So it's a rock. See, and you still don't hear what you just said. So it's a rock. And that rock is going to rock on the day of judgment and save you. And you, you know, still don't see it. What did I say earlier? Now, do you want me to show you that Muhammad is your God? Let me continue real quick. Didn't I say that rocks and trees come to life? Okay. So You're they, only making it worse for yourself. Why does the black stone come to life? To do what for you? Life as a witness. No, to defend you and say, Allah... This person it's, used to smother me. It's, Sometimes he got his saliva on me. It's no, and you need to forgive him. It's not just to defend. There's things you that want to bet that's what it is. They harm you. So when you see a you want to bet that's what it is that the stone for, is defending for, you because for, it's forgiving for, you of your sin. Yeah, yeah, no, I believe it. Guys, should I send him to Mecca? Because this guy's now just okay. It's a waste of time. Now, do you want to go to Muhammad as your God? Because I'm about to send you to Mecca. Do you want me to show you that Muhammad is your God? The other God you worship. I don't worship Muhammad. I follow him. No, you actually worship him, even though you deny it. Here, I'll, I'll prove it to you. Is submitting to Allah an act of worship when you submit to him? And what is Islam? Submitting to God. No, the Quran says Islam is to submit to Allah and Muhammad equally. You didn't even know that? We believe that. We believe that whatever Muhammad said came from you know what I asked you. the Holy Let's Spirit. Try. No, God forbid. Don't ever insult the Holy Spirit. But let me repeat again. Islam is perfectly submitting to Muhammad, not just Allah. I mean, he's dead, so. So you're saying he's dead? That means you just buried the Quran because the Quran says, unless you come to Muhammad and he prays for you, you'll find no forgiveness. So how does Allah forgive you now that Muhammad's dead? That's chapter 4, verse 64 of the Quran. It says, had they come to you, and ask Allah for forgiveness, and you prayed for, for forgiveness, they would find Allah most forgiving. So how can I come to Muhammad and pray to Allah and have Muhammad pray for me so that Allah show me mercy if he's dead? So are you saying the Quran is useless now? No, I'm saying right now in this physical world he's dead. But isn't the Quran for all Muslims at all times to the end of the age? So how can I follow 464 when it says, had they come to you, Muhammad, and they prayed and asked Allah to forgive, and you prayed for their forgiveness, then Allah would be most merciful to them. How can I obey that command now that Muhammad is dead? I mean, didn't you say that people can pray for you when they're dead because they're still alive in the spirit? That's what I wanted to hear. So that's why your Muslims say you can still obey that command by going to the grave of your prophet and greeting your prophet and asking him to forgive you. So you're okay going to the grave of Muhammad and talking to a dead man and asking... No, they say, that's shirk. they say that's shirk. No, it isn't. I have the statements from Ali ibn Abu Talib as well as from <clears throat> Utbi, cited by Ibn Kathir, saying that the Muslims did it shortly after Muhammad died. Where are you getting shirk from? You can't ask for forgiveness from anyone except for God. Friend, chapter 4 verse 64 says, you got to go to Muhammad... 
And he's got to ask for forgiveness for you when you ask Allah to forgive. And that's when Allah will show you mercy. 464. You have to go to him. Read it, 464. It's no. right there. One second. Yeah. Okay. And we did not send any messenger except to be obeyed by by permission of Allah. And if when they wronged themselves, they had come to you, O Muhammad, and asked forgiveness of Allah, and the messenger had asked forgiveness for them. Why do you go to Muhammad? To do what? To kiss the black stone together or to dance Cheikhani? Why do you go to they, Muhammad there? They had come to you, O Muhammad, and then asked forgiveness of Allah. And, and what must he do? He asks for you. Then Allah will be merciful, right? They would have found Allah accepting of repentance and merciful. Ah, but now Muhammad is dead. So how can I now go to Muhammad and Muhammad pray and I pray so Allah would be most willing to forgive me? He's dead, right? I mean, on the day of judgment. <laughs> what? This is not talking about the day of judgment. It's talking about the time of your prophet. Okay, but he's not here right now. So you're telling me then the Quran is garbage because this part of the Quran is useless. I can't do it. No, that's not so true. Then how do I obey that command in the Quran? So it's saying when they wronged themselves, they had come to you, O Muhammad. Yeah, to you. Come to you. Okay, this was when he was alive. Okay, so now he's and dead. So this verse is now useless, right? Not necessarily. And so as then how do I obey this command? What's that? How do I obey this command? Like I said, the day of judgment. It doesn't say day of judgment. Why are you adding oh, to the yeah, Quran? No, you're right. Because at the day of judgment, no. God, it doesn't so, say day of judgment. So so we believe, like I said, Prophet Muhammad intercedes for us on the day of the day of judgment. We're, forget day of judgment. This is talking about now. Now. Stop going to the future. Change the subject. How do I go to Muhammad and have him pray for me now? So when I ask Allah to forgive me, Allah will forgive me. I want to know how can I do that verse now? Read chapter 9, verse 103 for me. Go to chapter, there's another one. Chapter 9, verse yeah, 103. but this is also saying that this is for any prophet. This is for any messenger. No, it's talking about, there's no prophet after Muhammad. It's talking about Muhammad look coming Muhammad. to him. Or though, look, it says. Don't change the subject, man. Go to 9, 103. Chapter nine, 103. Same, same. We're on the same passage, and we did not yes. any messenger. Who is the messenger they go to? If they came to you, you're telling me that's Jesus? To any messenger. No, if they come to you, who's the you? And we did not send any messenger. Finish it before I send it to Black Stone to Lake Except it. to be obeyed by And the finish it, the rest of it. And if when they wronged themselves, they had come to you. Who's you? Moses? Oh, Muhammad, he was the messenger. Oh, stop changing the subject because you just said Muhammad is the final prophet. He's the messenger. So how do I come to him? Is Allah going to send me another messenger that I go to right now? No, he's the final messenger. Okay, earlier you said he's the final prophet, not the final messenger. I'm glad you just contradicted yourself. Good. No, no, okay. I looked it up. He's the final prophet. Oh, you have to look it up. So now that Muhammad is the final messenger, there is no messenger that's going to come after him for me to go to. So... How do I go to the final messenger, Muhammad, to have him pray that Allah forgive me if he's dead? Just by asking Allah. And I'm sure Sayyidina That's Muhammad. That's not what the verse says. He's they good. had come to you. Okay. How am I going to go to Muhammad and have him pray for me? So when I pray to Allah, Allah will forgive me. He's dead. So how do I carry out that command? I don't know. Exactly. So now that you're being honest. Now go to chapter 9, verse 103. 903? Yes. Now, guys, uh, if you return it, I want to just ask you guys. You still want me to do part four, responding to Ray Comfort, guys? Put a one if you want me to do it, Lord willing. I can do it immediately when I finish this or I go at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Let me know because right now it's 8 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. When I'm done, I can immediately go and do that or do it at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So let me know. Do you guys want me to do it 10.30 p.m. scheduled or right when I finish this? Tell me right when you finish this or 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Let me know.
This was impromptu. Okay. How many guys oh. want me to take right. Muhammad from their wealth? Slowly, slowly, so we can hear it out loud. Okay, take chapter 9, verse 103. Take, O Muhammad, from their wealth a charity by which you purify them and cause them increase and invoke Allah's blessing upon them. Okay, before you go on. Okay, guys, more said 1030. It's going to be 1030 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So that means in two hours from now, pray for me. Now, one more time, read chapter 9, verse 103. Take. O Muhammad, from their wealth, a charity by which you purify them and cause them increase and invoke Allah's blessing upon them. Indeed, your invocations and reassurance for them and Allah is hearing and knowing. Okay, now this verse says that uh, Muhammad, your prophet, takes alms from the Muslims and then he prays for them and they will be purified and forgiven, right? Here, let me get you. Let me put it on the screen so people can see. Here, chapter 9, verse 103. Guys, it will be 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to stay with the same time. 9.103. Here you go. 9.103. So they can see what we're reading. Now watch. Take alms of their wealth, wherewith thou mayest purify them. You may purify them and make them grow and pray for them. Lo, thy prayer is an assuagement for them. Allah is here and knower. So here I'm told. Let me read another version. Halali Khan. So I'll give you multiple versions. Here I'm told that Muhammad takes charity from a Muslim. And when he does, he'll purify them, cleanse them, make them grow. And he prays for them. And his prayer will grant me security. Here, chapter 9, verse 103. Take sadaqah, alms from their wealth, in order to purify them and sanctify them with it. And invoke Allah for them. So now, verily your invocation, source of security for them. Now, let me ask you a question. Here it says, if a Muslim comes and gives Muhammad charity, he takes it and he prays. That prayer is a source of security for the Muslim. And when he takes the charity from them, he purifies them. Now that Muhammad is dead, how can I go to Muhammad, give him alms so he can pray for me, so I can have security from his prayer and be purified from my sin now that he's dead? How do I follow this command? Just by giving charity. It didn't say that. Muhammad has to take the charity from me. Read it carefully. He has to take it from me, and then he prays for me. How can I have Muhammad take charity from me and pray for me so I'm guaranteed security from Allah and purification now that he's dead? We don't need to give Prophet Muhammad Wasallam charity. That's not what the verse says. It's stuck for Allah, stuck for Allah. I keep reading the verse, and you keep correcting Allah. I'm saying... Did Allah yeah. say... You can't. You can't. How are you going to give him charity if he? That's what I'm asking you. Don't. Why? That's the problem. Why you need to leave Islam? Why, why is it a problem? Because here it says, Muhammad is the one who will pray for you to guarantee security for you, and he will purify you by taking your charity. But now that Muhammad is dead, how can I know that I am secure and purified? Because he's not here to pray for me or take charity from me. Okay, and then the next verse after that says... You can read 5 million verses. I still want one, you to do with this one, one. Right next to it says, Do they not know that Allah is the one who accepts repentance from his servants? and How? How does he accept it? And I'm receives charity that it is Allah who is accepting of repentance. How does he accept it? By you going to Muhammad, he will accept it. What are you not getting? What do you mean? I don't need to go to Prophet Muhammad. Yes, you do. 9103 just said it and 464 said it. This is of the time of the prophet. So that's my question. Now that he's dead, so you're saying these verses are now garbage. They're useless. They have They're no meaning. Garbage. This is what they went. Oh, so these verses are now useless. They have no meaning today. No. It exactly. just shows that people used to give Muhammad charity. Okay. charity. Let, I'm going to ask the question one more time that I got to send you because you're not getting it. One more time. I'm going to see if you get it. Yeah. I mean, right now, sure. It, it's not useful. So these verses are useless. They have no meaning for Muslims today. I guess. Okay, you guess. Now, I want to ask you another question. Did you read the verse carefully? Who purifies you? Indeed. Charity by which you, from their wealth, a charity by which you purify them. And Who purifies them? them increase. Take by them. which you purify them. Who purifies them? Yeah, so he purifies them. Who's he? 
the prophet Muhammad. thank you you see now guys you heard it from his own mouth yeah the prophet purifies them that's why you're a Muhammadan and you worship Muhammad because you just said Muhammad purifies you of sin thank you we got you recorded and you still think you don't worship Muhammad you're a pagan I don't you just said Muhammad purifies them purification means purify them of sin something only God does you ascribed it to Muhammad you committed shirk because your God made you commit shirk good hey, job that that's that's a miracle that's one of his miracles it's a miracle that Allah made you a pagan Muhammad and committing shirk that's the miracle and now you're being sarcastic no it's true you're not waking up you're not seeing it man it's okay anyway so hey very listen. carefully with an open mind yes I'm okay honest. Now, my mind is very open so so Jesus could purify you. Yeah, because Jesus is God in the flesh. We don't think Muhammad is God in the flesh. So tell me, Muhammad is God in the flesh like you believe Jesus is God in the flesh. No, I don't. I don't believe that. So why are you comparing Muhammad to Jesus? Jesus is God in the flesh. Because I was, he's... He I, was, I wanted to say that I, any prophet could purify somebody. No, no, that's not what it says. Only God purifies and forgives. But that's, that's in your Quran, chapter 3, verse 135, and it's in my Bible. But that nice means, let me grab my charger. Do you want to take like a five-minute break? No, what we'll do is come back some other time because it's already two hours. Yeah, it's been two hours. Let's do something this week. You're a good guy. I like you. I'm sorry I've got to be heated with you because I'm hoping the Holy Spirit will shake you. But I have to do another stream in two hours. I need a break. So, Lord willing, contact me this week. We'll do another one, all right? Okay, sounds good. All right, take Those... care, buddy. Bye. Okay, brethren, pray for him. Suhaib. Suhaib. Khatab. Pray for him. Pray that he'll go back and re-listen to this because if he listens to it by the conviction of the Holy Spirit with an open heart, his foundation will be rocked and destroyed. He will not be the same if you're praying because it's the Holy Spirit who will have to rock his world, turn his world upside down, shake his foundation because he didn't realize, he just admit he's a pagan. Muhammad is a false god erected by Satan, Allah's partner, and that Muhammad was an immoral, misogynist, and the Quran is useless. It's full of garbage because it has verses you cannot do anymore because Muhammad is dead. So the Quran is trash and it's useless because without Muhammad, many of the verses are garbage. You can't act upon them. Now, guys, pray for me, Lord willing, in two hours, go to my YouTube channel. I have it scheduled. I'm going to respond to Ray Comfort, but I need your prayers, brethren. You're back, Ninos, again. Did I not block you, Ninos, yesterday? Ninos, Ninos, are you one of my stalkers, dude? Did I not block you? All right, anyway. Guys, I need your prayers. Okay? Because I'm human and I'm I get weak and I get tired. Can you guys pray? Ask the Lord Jesus in his love to flood my daughters and I in the living waters, the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will fill us. Holy Spirit grant us perfect safety, security, protection, health, and the Holy Spirit give me energy to get healthier. Ask the Holy Spirit to have mercy on me. Set me free from food addiction, lust to walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ, to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, and to be disciplined, to keep exercising, eating right, to keep the weight off, because I need to be healthier. I need to keep the weight off. Thank the Lord he's giving me discipline. Because without the Holy Spirit, I will fail. Ask the Spirit to give me the health I need, the strength I need, the holiness, and for my daughters to be perfectly safe and healthy, and my daughters be brought to me so I can raise them love of Jesus Christ. So... Brethren, in two hours, Lord willing, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, Michigan Time, Part 4. Let me go take a break, and let's glorify the Lord together. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus, almighty Son of God. You are risen, God in flesh. We love you, Holy Spirit. Seal us and empower us and strengthen us to love Jesus and never shame Jesus and walk worthy, Lord, and bring my daughters to me. And Holy Spirit, help me. This one stay healthy and fit. Set us free from our vices and sins. Break my bondage to food and lust and walk worthy of you. Name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And Holy Mother, Theotokos, we love you. Pray for us. Our mother, my mother, the mother of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has honored you. Intercede for us, Holy Mother. We love you. Gr crowd, we had over 2,000. May the numbers increase for the glory of Jesus Christ, not for my praise. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I love you guys. See you in two hours, Lord willing.